my name is Eric Stenman, but uh, most people call me Happy, perhaps because my general positive attitude, or it might be because I come from Haparanda, which is sort of as far north as you can get. If it hadn't been for the Gulf Stream, it would have been permanent ice over Haparanda, but luckily right now at least we have the Gulf Stream, so you can live there. Uh, it's uh, sort of dark and snowy most of the time and far away from everything. So in the 70s and 80s when I grew up, there was of course no internet and Haparanda has only about 9,000 people and I think we were three that were interested in computers so there were not that many meetups at that time. <laughs> so uh, uh, I was interested in programming, or actually, I was interested in games, of course. This is a uh, type of really nice games we had at that time. Uh, and uh, this intrigued me, so I wanted to get into games. And I realized that there, there were three parts. You could do the sound and music, and I sucked at that. You could do the graphics, and well, I uh, was okay with graphics, but... Uh, I decided that I better go for pro programming. So in 1980, I started to learn how to program in order to become a game programmer. It took a little bit longer than I thought. So last year, after 36 years, I released my first game, commercial game. Uh, it was, of course, a fantastic commercial failure and has left no trace whatsoever on the history of gaming, but the, the site is there, straboga.com, you can go and play chess for free, congratulations. But I can now say that I'm a game programmer, so 36 years and I'm a game programmer. But that's not why I'm here today. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about what I learned during those 36 years from starting to learn to program and to actually become a game programmer. And most of that time I spent uh, doing Erlang, so I'm going to talk about Erlang and the beam. That's why I'm here. The question is why you are here. Probably you read in the abstract that I was going to talk about the beam and the components in the beam, uh, but I'm not really going to do that. So there's another presentation and I have it here and uh, uh, you can go and look at it online also that uh, shows everything. There's also a book that is actually now online uh, on GitHub, uh, the, the Beam book, uh, that has uh, been more popular than I thought because it's just a manual. Uh, but uh, there you can read about all the details about how the Beam works. I'm going to talk a little bit more about why the Beam works as it does uh, today and talk on a little bit higher level uh, about the beam and then make a few uh, deep dives into some details. So, what was the problem? The problem that uh, beam tries to solve is to build software system that runs forever. So as Richard said, I used to work for this small startup that became a large startup, uh, providing a payment solution that had to be up 24 seven. And the first five years we just kept on adding uh, stuff to uh, the system and the system was just keeping up with uh, the traffic. But we had one problem, growth. So uh, the traffic was doubling every 10 to 11 months. So there was a exponential growth. We got more customers and there were more and more people starting to buy things online and we got more and more salespeople in and we got more and more customers. Uh, well, when I say it's a problem with growth, of course, that's for the tech department. The rest of the company didn't see the growth as a problem. They, they thought it was great. But for the tech department, it was a little bit of a problem. 
but since uh, for the rest of the company it just was the good thing, it meant that we got more and more money so we could just scale horizontally. So we just bought larger and larger computers, uh, finally running on a two terabyte machine with uh, 40 cores, 80 with hyper-threading. So that sold uh, uh, the problems for another couple of years. But there were some bumps in the road. So at one time, um, for example, we had this XML parser that crashed. And in Erlang, uh, when you have a term that is shared within the process, it keeps uh, everything shared on the heap. So if you parse and build up a tree with lots of subtrees of the thing you're parsing, all these subtrees will just be kept in, in one place. So it worked fine for, for some time, and then for some reason there was some bug in the parser, and it crashed, uh, and then it threw its state to its supervisor and said, oh, I'm, I'm dying, here, take care of my data. And then, of course, the state uh, expanded, because at that time, Erlang copied uh, all the state when it crashed and expanded all the terms. And then suddenly one process had more than 32 gigabytes of, of data. And this was obviously the first time in Erlang's history that this happened because the garbage collector crashed and the whole system went down. Uh, it took some time to figure that uh, event uh, loop out, but finally we did. And nowadays I think there's even a, the hype group has provided a, uh, way that you can choose to compile your Erlang system so that you even keep sharing when you send messages between processes. We also had a uh, domain-specific language in the system that decides whether we should accept credit for a customer or not. So in this system you could write rules like, uh, well, you have to be over 18 and uh, it's nice if you have an income and things like this. And it was backtracking like a prologue system a little bit. So it did backtracking by having try catches uh, and compiled to Erlang code and then had try catches. And at that time you couldn't have more than 4096 try catches in uh, the system at the same time. This was a statically, uh, static array that kept all the uh, try catches with a little comment, oh, this should probably be dynamic, smiley face, exit, smiley face. Uh, and uh, the exit code was not uh, zero, but minus one and disappeared somehow. So it took some time to figure out that when we loaded new code and the system crashed, it was because we had too many try catches. Fortunately, the new version of Erlang at that time had already sold this. We had just not upgraded yet, so that was easily sold. <coughs> a third little bump in the road uh, was that since we had this really, really powerful machine, it meant that sometimes, especially during night, the system could see that, oh, I don't, I don't seem to have that much work to do. And the Erlang scheduler works that way that if if a, one of the schedulers don't any, have any work to do, it goes to sleep to save power. And all the schedulers but one went to sleep. And then this last scheduler got a bunch of uh, big terms that it wanted to write into a database. Don't ask me why. But at this point, it got these. Uh, hundreds and thousands of them, and they were like gigabytes large. Uh, and there was one instruction in the theme where you could do term to binary, which didn't really count as work by the scheduler. So normally you can do something called reduction, 4,000 reductions, and then that process is put to sleep and the next process get to run. So you get to do 4,000 function calls and then someone else get to run. But term to binary counted as one function call. 
So you could do 4,000 turns to binary that could take one gigabyte of data and turn it into a binary. And this, of course, took a lot of time. So outside our system, we had this other process called heart that was pinging the system. Are you live? Are you live? Are you live? And the system was, no, I'm doing term to binary. I'm doing term to binary. And the heart went, hmm, you're not really responding. <laughs> and killed the system. So it had too little work to do, and then it was killed um, in the middle of the night. Fun stuff. But that was not really uh, uh, any problem with Erlang per se or the system. It was just strange things that happened, yeah. But um, as you know, with exponential growth, what eventually will happen is that this slow trickling that you hardly notice suddenly just goes boom. And uh, of course, we had just had fun uh, adding new features to the system and not really trying to scale it. So when this happened, we started to get some uh, more serious problem with the actual code. And we had to go in and make the system scale vertically instead and find all the bottlenecks and rewrite it. Fortunately, then for us, this was written in Erlang and we could quite easily do this. So, what makes Erlang so great? Erlang was designed from the ground up to build and maintain telephony systems. So in, in 1970, Ericsson that made telephone switches and Televerket, which was the Swedish national uh, telephony exchange, uh, started a company together to build the next generation of telephone switches. And uh, this is an official picture from Ericsson's history site when they built the X system. So uh, building this system included uh, designing their own microprocessor and their own programming language, Plex. Uh, and in 1976, the first switch was delivered. And by 1992, Ericsson had 40% of the uh, global mobile uh, telephone switching market with this new uh, switch. So uh, that went very well. This company that was started, the LMTEL, also started a lab in early 80s. And it was this lab that decided that we should actually find a way to program these switches a better way uh, than uh, Plex. So uh, this was when uh, Joe, uh, Robert Weirding, and Mike Williams set out to uh, make something like Plex only better and to run on uh, ordinary hardware. So no uh, microprocessor designed only for doing this. So they had to make a programming language that could handle all the hard parts of getting a system that runs forever. So it had to be always up and running. And for that, you had to be able to also upgrade the code on the fly. This you could do already with Plex, but you had people flying around all the world and updating the system by hand. Uh, and it should be able to run forever, uh, not only running uh, uh, every day of every week and so on, but it should run for decades. So it has to be able to grow. It should be distributed, handling large data sets, highly concurrent and soft real time. So. This, of course, led to Erlang. And this is probably the most important uh, slide in the presentation. If you want to build a system that you can run for decades, that can run forever, 
you have to uh, be able to understand and upgrade that system and other people's and original writers has to understand and upgrade this system. So having a language uh, where you can express the design of the system in a natural way uh, is needed and this is very related to how you think. So I first realized uh, the impact of language on thinking when I as a young Swede, 17-year-old, uh, went to the States as an exchange student. So when I was a kid, we started learning uh, English in school in third grade, so I could uh, speak and understand English quite well. Uh, didn't have the full vocabulary, and I still haven't really learned the pronunciation, as you can hear. But uh, I could at least understand the language and I could quickly enough translate in my head back and forth between English and Swedish. But after about two months, I stopped translating and started thinking in English instead. And after about a week, I realized I become stupid. Suddenly there was a lot of thoughts I couldn't think anymore. I just didn't have the words. So uh, <laughs> that was a scary experience. So I started thinking in English and uh, I could interact with people much more easily but I couldn't express myself, I couldn't even think the thoughts I wanted to think. So that was mostly because of my uh, lack of uh, uh, understanding and vocabulary in the language, but there are also subtle differences between Swedish and English in how you express yourself. For example, computer in Swedish is dator, which gives you a more static view of the thing. It's more like data storage than uh, actually computing things. Anyway, uh, that was how I realized that languages were important, uh, also for programming. And Erlang had to be fault tolerant, maintainable, and scalable, which led to the right concurrency model and uh, a good way to handle exceptions. Uh, exceptional exception handling, I would say. And also good libraries for the hard stuff. And you get an interactive shell that you can uh, work with the system to maintain it. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these things. But thinking in Erlang. So the most obvious thing is, of course, uh, the processes with no shared state. Uh, this makes it very natural to model many things uh, and uh, uh, especially things that interact with things like networks and users and so on. So that's uh, the obvious thing, but there are some other aspects that Erlang helps you do. So one is to be explicit. Uh, there's quite a few ways, uh, as in not so many, to uh, do every one thing in Erlang. It's not like C, C++ where you can add uh, one to a variable in uh, all kinds of ways. Uh, there's no destructive updates, so things do not happen in the background. Uh, and there's no undefined behavior like... Uh, this uh, C thing, I is I plus 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 one. Uh, you don't really know what that will do. That depends on the compiler. Uh, well, actually, Erlang has uh, no formal language specification at all, so everything is undefined. But apart from that, uh, everything is defined by the implementation because there's really only one implementation. Uh, and of course, uh, the order of uh, evaluating arguments is defined to be undefined. And that uh, sometimes trips people up because there are a few cases when they are not evaluated in the order you think. And there's, the best part is there's no easy way to redefine the language. Well, there's parse transforms, but you just don't use them. There's uh, other languages where you can define plus equal to 
mean insert into a database, for example, and that's, of course, very handy. Or you can do this thing that uh, finds something in a graph, who knows what, but uh, apparently uh, that operator in there find things in a graph. Very nice graph library for C, I think, or C++ um, that you can uh, use if you really want to have hard code to read. So some things uh, Alan is very explicit about, but uh, you can also be implicit about the things that you don't care about, like uh, garbage correct, uh, collection and error state. And you can uh, take this whole let it crash philosophy. So if you're uh, reading a file that's uh, uh, a configuration file that's supposed to be there, you wouldn't check for uh, if it's there or not. If it's not there, you crash and someone else has to handle this because it's supposed to be there. Or you can have a supervisor that restarts you if it's a file that's on a, a distributed network and it might be gone for a short time, but probably come back when uh, things have healed up. But when you want to read this file, you don't really care in the code whether it's there or not. It should be there. If it's a file that uh, might be there or not, then of course you would check the return values of your uh, read functions and handle the case where uh, the file isn't there and do something else. So you can choose to be uh, implicit and, and don't bother your code with error handling all over the place or you can be explicit about it. So that's very nice. So the beam is a garbage collecting reduction counting non-preemptive directly threaded register virtual machine. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what that is, sorry. But it's designed to be fault tolerant. So uh, to be fault tolerant, you have to be able to actually have more than one uh, machine that uh, in your system, which leads to concurrency. So processes can spawn functions, send messages, receive messages and wait for messages and then there's a scheduler that choose which process that will run. Uh, Alan processes are like operating system processes, uh, really separated and isolated, uh, but they're very lightweight. And in the implementation, it's basically just for memory areas and a pointer. So there's a stack for function calls, a heap for uh, storing data, a mailbox for incoming messages, and a process control block with information about the process and how it should behave. And then there's a pointer to it, a process identifier, a PID. This is not really true, so you can go to the Beam book if you want to know exactly how it works. Message passing is implemented by uh, the process trying to send a message to another process, trying to get a lock on that process mailbox, copying over the message you want to send to the other process heap, and then inserting the uh, pointer to that uh, new copy to the other process mailbox. So that's a, a sort of simple case, and that's not really how it works either, so you have to read the book. The scheduler works by having a, a number of queues, a ready queue where it picks the next process that's ready to run, and then it will call the Beam emulator to run that process for a number of reductions. That is function calls. And uh, when it has used up its number of reductions, it's put back at the end of the ready queue. If it comes to a receive, it will just, uh, and there's no message for it to pick out in the receive, it will just wait for, go to a waiting state and end up in another queue in the scheduler. And there's usually one scheduler per process core or uh, process 
uh, processor uh, hyper thread. A nice thing with allowing exceptions also and the whole memory handling thing is that when you spawn a new process, there is an explicit try catch that you start with. So if that process die and you haven't provided any try catch, it will be caught by that uh, uh, implicit uh, try catch. And then a signal will be sent to its supervisor or anyone that's monitoring the process. So that way you can detect that a process dies. And the supervisor is provided by the libraries that come with Erlang and supervisors are just processes that start other processes and can decide what happens when those processes die. So if processes die, uh, it can choose to restart it or it can kill all its siblings and restart them or it can kill itself and so on. There's also generic servers which an easy way to write servers that interact with other processes. Something that makes Erlang maintainable is the interactive shell. So you can always log into Erlang and uh, see exactly what's happening. And since it, Erlang is symbolic and also everything is tagged, you can actually look at anything in the memory and just understand what that thing in the memory is. And it supports code upgrades. So you can load new code into the system and uh, that code will be uh, called the next time you do a qualified call. And it has very powerful tracing and debugging built into the virtual machine. So it's quite easy to trace and debug even on live running systems. You can go in and do very cheap uh, tracing and debugging. Some things that make Erlang scalable are of course the very light processes and uh, the distribution that's of course necessary that you can run your Erlang uh, system on several machines. But I would also say that the weird strings are uh, very good in Erlang. So the string in Erlang is uh, just a list as uh, uh, you heard uh, in a previous talk here, the, the keynote. Uh, having just strings as list. So this is uh, very nice for the programmer, but of course you say that this is terrible because if you uh, look at the space that you use, so this is on a 32-bit machine, so for that uh, uh, five letter word hello, you would actually use 11 words. Um, and this is on a 32-bit machine, on a 64-bit machine, those 11 words would of course be 64 bits. So you use quite a few bits uh, for uh, just a short string. But those are not really the strings of Erlang. The strings of Erlang are the IO lists, and IO lists are not lists, they are trees. And uh, the leaves in these trees, they are actually just consoles. And in the leaves, you can either have an integer or a binary. So if you choose to have binaries, uh, you can choose to use just plain 8-bit uh, ASCII encoding, and then your strings will be just as space efficient as uh, in C, more or less. There's a little bit of overhead, of course, but almost as uh, space efficient. But you can do concatenation in order one time. So you just create a new console with uh, one old string and another old string, and then suddenly you have a new string with both of them. You don't have to traverse any of the strings. So even if they are like uh, two books, you can concatenate them in order one time and without taking up any more memory than just two more words on the heap. Of course, you can also have Unicode uh, support without having an encoding like UTF-8 or 16. You can just put the plain Unicode uh, there because uh, the leaves are integers, so they, you have 64 bits basically uh, for your integers, so you can have quite a few you know, different characters in your character set. So uh, most people uh, 
take it time before they understand that the, this, these are the Erlang strings, not uh, just the list of bytes that you're used to. Another cool feature of Erlang is the bit syntax. So if you, for some reason, work with 256 uh, bit words, you can easily pick out the start of the uh, 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 word and the end of the word, and then you don't care about eight bits in the middle from a 256 bit word, and then you put them together again, the start, the end, and your new byte somewhere in the middle. And this way you can build a new 256 bit word with one of the bytes updated. Or you can actually write a parser for the beam format with, by using the bit syntax, and you can just match on uh, the four uh, characters that make up the header of a beam module file that, that recognize that. And then you get the size of the whole uh, file, and then it should say beam, and then you have some chunks at the end. And then you can uh, parse these chunks, uh, figuring out the size of the next chunk, and then uh, picking out that chunk and then recursing over the rest of the thing. So with the bit uh, syntax, it's really easy to write uh, parsers for binary five formats or for network protocols like TCP or anything like that. So the beam is well suited uh, as a target for languages. So there are many languages implemented on the beam. And the beam is constantly evolving and it's being documented right now. So there's actually a number of languages implemented on the beam. Uh, Elixir is probably the uh, uh, most now nowadays, and um, uh, LFE is also quite popular. We at Happy Hacking are actually right now implementing the Ethereum virtual machine and going to design a new language for writing uh, smart contracts um, in the future, running on the Beam. Hype has been around to compile to native code for a long time, but OTP is now actually uh, tracing implementation, it's supposed to say there, coming from the OTP team. And if you want to help with the Beam book, not money, it's free, but uh, writing something, there are still a couple of chapters to be written, so please go to the Beam book. So I, what I wanted to say was that the language affects how you think, and when you think right, you write right, and well-written code is readable. Code has to be readable to be maintainable, and code has to be maintainable if you want to run a system forever. So that was my talk, and if you have any questions on the beam, I have another presentation here uh, that I can help answer any questions on the details of the beam. Questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much.